For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Rooted and grounded today. Amen. With me one more moment. King Jesus, once again, Lord, we come before you. Today, the skies are overcast. It's gray and cloudy outside, and I fear, Lord, that this has kind of crept its way into the church a little bit this afternoon. But God, I've come into the house of God as always. I come into the house of God with a desire to hear from heaven. Lord, since I was a child, I've held deep in my heart the conviction that the man of God, the preacher of the gospel, man or woman, boy or girl, must, must operate under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. For if the anointing is not present, then, Lord, there is no value to be had in any spoken word. But when the anointing of the Holy Ghost is real, and when the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes, then, Lord, even the simplest of minds is able to receive and digest and benefit from the Word of God. Lord, today I need your help. I, I've stepped into this sacred desk this afternoon with the intent, God, of being a blessing and a help and an encouragement to the people of God. And I want nothing less than this. Lord, touch every ear, every hearer, those who are outside of this place, those today watching by reason of the Internet, the many, many who will later watch this message by reason of the Internet. Let the power of God be felt in their lives. Oh God, don't let me merely speak words, but let me speak forth the power of God. Save, heal, deliver. Oh God, reconcile today. Bring back the backslider in response to the words that I shall speak. For I pray, God, that you'll place your words upon my lips. Place your words in my mouth, for it is the word of God and the word of God only that brings life and hope and healing. We ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The church may be seated this afternoon. Glory to God. Amen. Oh. You know, I'm well aware today that that a lot of affirming churches, especially those that call themselves affirming Pentecostal churches, are going to have services where people are running around and dancing and carrying on and putting on the dog, as they used to say. <laughs> I've been to conferences where I've seen these things happening, and I've seen people just, you know, going all out to appear as Pentecostal as they can appear. And then two minutes later, they're out there acting like the world and they're doing just the same way everybody else in the LGBT community does. And there is no difference between them and the unregenerate. There is no difference between them and the unsaved. There's no difference at all, Lisa, between them and those that don't know God. They, they go to church so they can put on their little jig and their little... 
And I'm going to tell you, I knew a preacher years ago in the church of God who had gone rogue. And I mean literally he had gone rogue. He, oh, he had turned his little congregation into something of a cult. And he was doing all kind of nasty negative things. I mean, he was having affairs with several women in his church. He had a wife and kids, and he was flipping around with several of the women in the church. And he had really, to be honest with you, he'd kind of lost his mind and, and was doing some really crazy things. The church of God eventually uh, defrocked him and took away his ordination and removed him from his position, but they don't do those things lightly. You know, they don't just rush in and do it. There has to be evidence. There has to be witnesses. And there is a procedure in place for such things. But I remember one day talking to this man, and this man looked at me and he said, Oh, I can preach a church happy in three minutes flat. I know how to get people shouting. I know how to get people happy. I know how to get people dancing and blah, blah, blah. And I sat there and I was a young Pentecostal preacher and I thought to myself, well, sure, I, I kind of understand that because, Johnny, there are certain topics that we get happy over. There are certain catchphrases that uh, it don't take much for a child of God to get a little excited. All you got to do is say, Jesus is Lord three times and the church is ready to shout the rafters off, you know. All you got to do is say, God's a healer. All you got to do is say, Jesus saves. All you got to do is say, there's power in the name of the Lord and, and God's people are going to get happy because those are truths that we hold very dear and they mean a lot to a bunch of spirit-filled Pentecostal people. So I understood and I thought to myself, well, I can do it too. And I can. But when you rely upon the Spirit of God to give you the messages that you preach, then guess what? That's not always the direction He takes you in. There was a time in my life, I'll never forget when I first come to Texas and I became part of the Riverside Church of God and my God have mercy. Riverside used to have shouting, dancing, running the aisle, Holy Ghost services more often than not. Let's put it that way, okay? And I, I got so excited and I'd go visit some other old time Pentecostal churches in, in the Fort Worth area and around the, the Texas area, you know. And I mean, every time we'd have one of them good old shouting Holy Ghost service, I'd come back to my Aunt Dorothy and I'd brag about how we had such a great shouting service. And I mean, it was wonderful. And Aunt Dorothy said to me, she said, honey, uh, you need to understand something. Every service don't need to be like that. Said so you, you need to get out of that mindset that that's what you're looking for. That's what you insist upon. That's what has to be for you to identify a service as being a good service. Well, I sit there and I thought, well, I don't know why she's saying that. She, she, just, she just don't understand some things, obviously. Somewhere along the line, her old fire's been put out, the Bill. I don't know what happened, but somebody put out her fire. But you know what? As time went on and as I grew older and as my walk with God became more clear, it suddenly dawned on me and I finally realized... That many, 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 many people in spirit-filled Pentecostal churches have a walk with God that is no deeper than their shout. The same people, even at Riverside, some of the same people that get up and shout every once in a while, they were the same ones who every other, when they weren't shouting, they were in the dumps. When they weren't shouting, they were depressed. When they weren't shouting, they were all sad-faced and moping around and the devil was whooping them and they were going through a trial and they were going through a hardship. And oh, Brother Martin, I'll tell you what. There was one guy that Brother Gillum, every once in a while, he'd ask this guy to sing. I hated it when he asked this guy to sing. 
Oh, Lord Jesus. And some of y'all probably feel that way about me singing. Don't shake your head. Yes, I don't want to know. But boy, I tell you, he'd ask this one kid if he were, and this kid would get up every single time. Every single time. And he'd get up behind the pool. Well, you know, I'll tell you, the devil just didn't want to be, and I just think all through such a trial, and I just, and I mean, boogers be hanging out of his nose, and tears be running down his face, and, and he depressed the fire out of me. I mean, my God, before he ever started singing, I was ready to go outside and hang myself. <laughs> and then he'd start singing. And of course, he'd sing, and his song would just be full of tears and full of woe. And yet, every once in a while, this same person decided they were going to shout. And every once in a while, this same person decided they were going to get happy. <sighs> I'm going to tell you, when your walk with God is based on what you're feeling, you've got a problem. When your walk with God is contingent upon your emotional state at the moment, you have a problem. I have come to realize that in the Pentecostal movement, and especially in the affirming Pentecostal circles, it is all about hype, it is all about emotion, it is all about feeling, it is all about getting people worked up into some sort of an emotional frenzy, and what you're missing is depth. What you're finding is people who are not rooted and grounded. The same people who are so easily moved by emotion and so easily moved by a good choir or a preacher who can preach them happy are the same people, Martin, who have roots that go about that far down into the earth. And when a good wind of tribulation or a good blow of trial comes their way, man, they are uprooted and sent miles and miles away. Do you know what I'm talking about now? Because they have no roots. They're not grounded. There is something missing in their walk with God. I've got news for you today. God is not concerned about how high your tree rises. There are a lot of people who look at this little church and they judge it and they criticize it and they don't think very much of it because if it were a tree, it's just a little old bush. So I got news for you. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. Not not a burning tree. Hallelujah to God. God didn't use the biggest tree on the mountain. He used a little old bush. But that bush was on fire. Hallelujah. So don't tell me it's about the size. I'm going to share a scripture with you in a little while that will show you that God is not impressed by how far outward your branches reach. He is not impressed, Martin, by how high the trunk of your tree rises. It's not what impresses God. God is concerned that we be rooted and grounded. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in our primary text today. And he said in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Who is the entire family of heaven and earth named after the Lord Jesus Christ? That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, listen, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, listen, in the inner man, hallelujah, not in the part that people can see, but in the invisible part of the inside of 
your soul. Paul said, I would, I pray to God that you experience the strength and the might that God's spirit can offer you in your inner man. Well, I'm going to tell you, a lot of these who can do all the jigging and the dancing and the hollering and then they leave the church and go a whoring and the smoking and the drinking. They have no strength in their inner man. One of the mistakes I used to make that Aunt Dorothy tried to correct me and I learned she was more right than wrong. I hate to admit it. Don't ever, don't nobody tell her I said this now. <laughs> Oh, I mean, if somebody shouted all the time, I just thought they were the most spiritual person on the planet. I just thought, my God, they must have a walk with God like nobody's business if they're constantly shouting. And Aunt Dorothy tell me, say, honey, don't put all your stock in whether or not, you know, those leaves can flow with the wind. Whether or not those leaves catch the breeze every time it blows. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, sure. They, they are able to sway and move every time the Holy Ghost moves in the church. They're able to feel the breath of God. They're able to feel the blowing of the Spirit upon their branches. But are they rooted and grounded? Because i got news for you. Spirituality is about whether or not you reach high and wide and are able to move with the blow of the wind. You see, the move of God is likened unto the blow of a wind. Jesus said the Spirit is like the wind. You can't see where it comes from or where it's going, but you can see its effects. Yeah, these people can be affected by the move of God. They can be affected, Martin, by the move of the Holy Ghost. But that just means they're reaching high. That just means they're reaching wide. But how strong are they on the inside? How deep do their roots go? Are they rooted? Are they grounded? Oh my goodness. Now listen, let's continue with what Paul had to say in Ephesians chapter 3. He said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in judgment Boy, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to live for God, if you're going to walk with the Lord, then you better be rooted, Martin. Your roots better dig deep into an understanding that God is one day going to judge the world. Mm. That you may be rooted and grounded in fear. Oh, you better fear God. You better know God could squish you like a bug. You better know that at any moment, if you don't act right, that God can call you to account. Bless God. I'll tell you, I know a lot of Christians today, that's exactly where their roots dig into. That is exactly as far as their understanding of God goes. And I tell them the truth now. Oh, and that's why every time things get hard in this life, every time things start to get difficult, they are like the chaff. They get blown away by it. All of a sudden, they get pulled up by the roots. If your relationship with God is rooted in judgment, if your relationship with God is rooted in condemnation, if your relationship with God is rooted in fear, I got no for you honey your roots cannot go very deep there's a whole lot more to God than these things Amen. my Lord have mercy but Paul wrote to the church specifically of what substance he desired that God's people's roots dig into and grab hold of because this substance, if you understand this about God, it'll keep you steady in the most unsteady of times. Hallelujah. It'll keep you rooted when the winds are blowing hard. And when tribulation has come upon you. And trials 
also working against your soul. What did Paul say? He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Oh, hallelujah! If you keep in your mind that God loves you and there isn't a thing in the world, there isn't a thing in heaven, there isn't a thing in hell, there isn't a thing on this planet that can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you can keep that in mind and in your heart, you will be rooted and grounded. And you will not be easily moved. Amen. Doesn't matter what trial comes your way. Doesn't matter. Oh, oh, I had an issue some 30 years ago. It used to give me a lot of grief. Had an issue. Most of y'all know what I'm talking about. You had the same issue. It used to give me a whole lot of grief. The only reason it gave me grief is because my roots only went down into the soil of judgment. Amen. Only because my roots went down into the soil of criticism. Only because my roots went down into the soil of fear. Oh, but I'm going to tell you, one day God spoke to me. And Johnny, you know what he told me? He said, dig a little deeper. <laughs> dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. Get them roots down further. <laughs> oh, hallelujah to God. Let your soul be hungry for the water. Let your soul be searching for the water that brings life. Because fear and condemnation and guilt and those sorts of things will only kill you. It's a pretty stupid plant that lays down roots, Martin, that go six inches below the surface of the soil and then just reaches out from that six inches looking for the source of life, water. It's a pretty dumb plant. That they, now, there are some plants that do that. And I got news for you. Those are the easiest plants in the world. Tear up. Those are the easiest plants in the world. Grab a hold of, give them a good yank, and here they come. Hallelujah. And it don't matter how far their roots go, you just pull Johnny and their whole root will come up because they're not very deep. But boy, howdy, let me tell you, where I come from in Connecticut, we've got pine trees that stand up 60, 80 feet tall. I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to try to dig out that old pine root. You don't want to try to dig that root out of that tree, honey. You're going to be digging a long time. Those pine trees are up in the mountains, Lisa. Those pine trees are at high altitude. But you know what? Their roots go deep. Hallelujah. Their roots know I can't afford to stay on the surface. I've got to dig deeper. I've got to look for that water. I've got to find that which brings life to my being. And as children of God today, how many people in our community are backslid? How many of the people in our community are away from God? All because they quit searching for the water. Hallelujah. No, I stopped looking for water because the first six inches of my roots were based in the fear that I grew up with. And the next six inches was my understanding of the judgment of God that is to come. And I just quit there because it was too much work to keep looking for water. Mm. Oh, but Paul said, I'm praying for you that you can be strengthened in your inner man. Hallelujah. How? He said, oh, that you be rooted and grounded in love. Amen. 
My God, I grew up in a church where they claim that the primary passage of Scripture that expounds the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that was what they claimed plainly so was the primary passage in the entire Bible that put in a nutshell the heart of the gospel. And that's about as much as they talked about the love of God. Because pretty quick it got to rules. Pretty quick it got to regulation. Pretty quick the message turned to fear. Pretty quick the message turned to judgment. Pretty quick the message turned to condemnation. Good God have mercy. No wonder people have a hard time finding love. No wonder people have a hard time digging a little deeper in the well till they tap into the love of God. Because the love of God is is not what we are most often offered. Right. Hello now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, I, I tried to plant some plants around the front of our house, and we must have, I, I mean, we must have poison soil. <laughs> we must have soil that just demons must infiltrate it or something. I tried to plant some plants around outside the front of our house, and I mean, honey, in a week's time, those poor things looked as dead as dead could be. Now, I don't claim to have the greenest thumb, but I mean, it's greener than planting the plant today and it being dead a week from now, you know. I told Tommy when I bought some new plants, I said, I'm going to do things differently this time. I'm going to dig a big old hole. I'm going to fill it with good soil. I'm going to get some of that good old rich miracle crow soil that you buy at Lowe's. Lowe's loves me. I put so many of their kids through college. Said, I'm going to get me as much of that good old uh, garden soil as I can get from Lowe's miracle grow baby. It's got all the magic chemicals in it. It's got all the fertilizer in it. It's got all the ingredients in it. And I'm going to fill that hole with that miracle grow soil. Then I'm going to plant my plant in that miracle grow soil. And let's see if I get a different outcome than I got by just digging a hole in front of the house, burying the plant, and sticking the same old soil I took out of the hole around it. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Boy, Martin, I'm going to tell you, those plants in front of the house are doing wonderful. There isn't a one of them that isn't growing. There isn't a one of them that isn't prospering. There isn't a one of them that isn't showing buds and showing flowers. No, them rose bushes I did on the side of the house, my God, those things have come up so big and bushy that, you know, practically the whole side of the house is covered with rose bushes. Ain't nobody breaking in our bedroom windows, I'll tell you, not without getting tore up. Well, I want to tell you, it's all about the soil. It's all about what you put around the roots. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, it makes such a difference. People come into this church and they find out that no matter what, God loves them. When they're pleasing Him, God loves them. And when they're displeasing Him, God loves them. When they're making the Lord happy, God loves them. When they're making the Lord sad, God loves them. When they're in the church living for God with all their might, God loves them. And when they're backslid out in the world doing everything they know they ought not to be doing, I got news for you today. God still loves them. Oh, hallelujah. His attitude toward them, his feelings toward them have not changed one bit. Now their outcome can change because depending on the direction you take is going to determine where you wind up. I got a little news for you today, children. All roads do not lead to Rome. Amen. 
That's that old saying, you know, back in the days of the Roman Empire. Everybody said, well, all roads lead to Rome. Well, that is not true in the real world. Never has been, never will be. You take the wrong road, you're going to wind up at the wrong destination. But even while you're slipping away, even while you're going down the wrong path, God still loves you. You want God to demonstrate that love for you? Just start making your way home like the prodigal son and see if daddy isn't sitting on the porch <laughs> waiting and looking and longing for you to come over the horizon. Hallelujah. See it. Daddy isn't sitting there waiting to see if he hears a creak in the old hinge at the gate that leads into your estate. The prodigal son recognized even as he was in the pig pen, even when he was in the worst place he'd ever found himself in his entire life, he said, in my father's house. Amen. Who, what? Amen. said, in my father's house, even the servants eat well. What? In your father's house? Yeah. Cause just because I'm here don't mean he's still not my daddy. <laughs> I may not be living at home. Hey, I haven't lived at home in a long time, but my mother's still my mother and my dad's still my dad. That didn't change just because I changed addresses. Hello now. I got news for you, backslidden child of God. God's still your father whether or not you changed addresses. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter if you're living in a crack house or a brothel or a bar room. It doesn't matter. God is still your father. Father. And if you want to know if daddy still loves you, just take one step in his direction and see if he don't meet you halfway. Amen. <sighs> Word of God said, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. The prodigal son started making his way home. And the minute... Bill, the minute Daddy saw that silhouette on the horizon, oh, hallelujah. Isn't that the interesting thing about parents that love their kids? They don't have to see your face to know it's you. They don't have to be able to discern the full outline of your body to know it's you. No, there's something inside that says, hey, that's my kid. And I can just see that old prodigal son father sitting on the porch. He was sitting there for a reason. He wasn't just there to be lazy. No, he was sitting there with a purpose. I'm waiting to see if Johnny's going to come home. I'm waiting to see if my son is going to make his way home. And he was sitting there waiting on that kid. Now, he probably over the years had had all kinds of traveling salesmen come by. He probably had, you know, the rainbow vacuum salesman come by, try to sell him a rainbow. He probably had Martin come by and try to get him to plan his funeral. He probably had all kinds of characters come to his door trying to get him to buy something or do something or believe something. But when he saw the silhouette of that boy, he knew that's my kid, what I've been waiting for is finally coming to pass and immediately the word of God said he leapt to his feet and he began to run in the direction of his son. Draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Got news for you today. Whoever you are, wherever you are, God still loves you. He's always loved you. He never stopped loving you. And all you need to do to see him demonstrate that love in your direction is make a move toward him. And I promise you, he'll come running. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about my daddy. His, his uh, legs are able to make much bigger strides than mine. <laughs> For every one step I make, he makes five. Hallelujah. 
for every. So you know what? You don't have to make a whole lot of effort toward God for God to make a whole lot more effort toward you. Oh, I want to tell you today, where you lay your roots is going to make a lot of difference in whether or not you grow. Where you lay your roots is going to make a whole lot of difference in whether or not you become rooted and grounded. Where you lay your roots is going to make a whole lot of difference whether you rot and fade away or whether you live and you survive and you're able to stand even in the most difficult and tumultuous of times. The Word of God tells us that toward the end of this age, there's going to be a shaking in the church. And God is going to shake things up. And everyone, Martin, that is not firmly planted in the vine is going to fall off the tree like a dead leaf or like a loose acorn or a loose pine cone. And the ground is going to be littered with people who at one time called themselves saints and called themselves believers. And only the healthy are going to still be clinging to the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Outside of me you can do nothing. Oh my goodness. Only those who are clinging to the master. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't cling to somebody you're afraid of. You don't cling to somebody who judges you. You don't cling to somebody who criticizes you. You cling to somebody who loves you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at a baby and see if that baby, uh, when you put that baby in the arms of a stranger, you put that baby in somebody's arms that that baby don't know. And that child's going to be looking back at mommy and saying, mommy, take me back. Take me back. Why? Because I know you love me. Oh, hallelujah. Is this at all encouraging today? Yes. yes. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I told you it might be. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. Mm. See, you've got to be rooted and grounded in love if you're ever going to understand how great God's love is. That's why the enemy fights so hard to make people believe God is everything but love. Did you hear what I said today? That's why the enemy fights so hard to make you believe that God is everything in the universe except love. Because if you cannot set your roots in the love of God... You will never understand how deep it is. You will never understand how wide it is. You will never understand how broad it is. You will never understand how massive the love of God is. You can't possibly understand it until you tap into it. Hello now. Oh my goodness, have mercy. I've heard people share their near-death experiences. And they say that they see a light, you know, you've heard people talk about seeing a light, and they say, and I, there's this love that emanates from this light. Mm -hmm. They said, you literally feel love without seeing a person. Without seeing a person, without seeing a being, without seeing some visage of some sort, Martin, all they see is light. But from that light emanates this sensation of love that just envelops them. And that love just suddenly gives them such a peace and a calmness and an assurance. 
Well, that's funny. My Bible says, A, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But guess what else it says? God is love. See why the enemy wants to keep the love of God as far from our mind as he can keep it? You want to see why the enemy wants to keep the love of God from as far from our understanding as he can get it? Because, honey, if you ever tap into the love of God, there ain't a thing in the universe the enemy ever do that will uproot you. There's not a thing in the world the enemy will ever be able to bring into your life that will displace you from the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. There is not a storm, a trial, a temptation that will ever overcome your soul. Hallelujah. And to know the love of Christ, listen, which passeth knowledge. So Paul says... So you can know the love of Christ, but guess what? The love of Christ is unknowable. So you can know it, the best you can know it, but you'll never know it all. So you can understand it the best you can understand it, but you'll never understand it all. It's bigger than you are. I was in a camp meeting years ago in the Church of God. I'll never forget it so long as I live. It was the most incredible. We had a marvelous service, and this is one of those times where it's not about the shout. This is one of those times where it wasn't about us dancing in the air. I, mean, I love those services. Don't misunderstand me. I love the move of God. But in this particular service, people had come to the altars, the church, the, the, the tabernacle was full of God only knows how many hundreds of people. People had come to the altars and all of a sudden the spirit of the Lord descended. I will never forget this. It was the most incredible thing. The spirit of the Lord descended in that building and I felt as did every other person in the auditorium. The pure unaltered Love of God like I have never felt the love of God before. I didn't feel power. I didn't feel fire. I didn't feel all of that. No. The love of God descended on this building. All of a sudden, it went dead silent. And people just begin, tears begin to stream down all of our faces. You could not even get a word to come out of your mouth. It was like God had come down and wrapped his arms collectively around that congregation and just allowed us to listen to his heartbeat. Just allowed us to hear his heartbeat. And I never felt the love of God in my life like I felt it that day. And it silenced an auditorium with probably a thousand people in it. And we all just stood there. Just It almost took your breath away. Paul said, you, now you think you understand the love of God? You listen, it's, it's bigger than that. It goes further than that. That's why I believe Martin, instead of preaching people into hell because they commit suicide or preaching somebody into hell because they lived a devilish life and uh, are preaching somebody into hell because they didn't fully embrace this apostolic message. And again, I repeat, do not think I don't believe in this apostolic message, but also believe that God said, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, and I don't believe part of the Bible. I believe all of the Bible. And that's why I don't make judgments about where people have gone in the afterlife because I, I, I can't even understand how big God's love is. I don't know what kind of conversation Jesus may have had with that person. It may have been a conversation that seemed to last for hours, and yet in human time it lasted for seconds. How many times have people had so-called near-death experiences and they felt like they were gone for hours and when they came back they found out it was only 15 minutes? 
And they're like, what are you talking about? I was in heaven for hours. The Bible said a thousand years is with the Lord as a day. And a day as a thousand years. Honey, if God's time clock works a thousand years to one day, my Lord have mercy. Can you imagine what God can do in five seconds? That's probably about three weeks. <laughs> you understand what I'm telling you? I don't know. I don't know. So why I tell people, if you got to pray in grandma or if you got to pray in mama and their child dies and they assume that child died lost, I ask them, uh, have you been praying for that kid? Yes, I have. And the Lord didn't see fit to save them before they died. Oh, is that so? How do you know that? Do you believe God answers prayer? Don't you believe God answers prayer? I believe God answers prayer, but I think in this instance, he said, no, honey, don't make any assumptions. You don't know what conversation God had with that kid while he was in a coma. You don't know what kind of conversation God had with that kid while he was lying squashed on the highway next to the motorcycle he'd been riding. You don't know what kind of conversation God had with that young lady while she was on that operating table. Hello now. You don't know. So you got to get out of your mind that your knowledge is bigger than God's love. Hallelujah. you got to get out of your mind that you understand and you know so much that you can afford to make a judgment about where somebody's headed and where they're going. You don't know enough. Trust me. Keep your opinion to yourself. Nobody wants to hear it. I'm trying to wrap up today. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. By the way, principalities, he's literally speaking of demons. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, any other creation, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Rooted and grounded. Oh, you know, you may shout in church, but you still don't know for a fact that God loves you. You may shout in church, but you're shouting because you're constantly under a state of condemnation. You're constantly in a mindset of guilt. And every service you go to church, and you got to shout your way out of the guilt. I know, been there, done it. You got to shout your way out of the condemnation. You got to shout your way out of the judgment. You got to shout your way out of the fear. You know why? Because that's where your roots are. See, Johnny, a plant can only take in what the plant is in. You know, there's an old saying, you are what you eat. Well, the same thing's true of a plant. Amen. You plant a tree and a bunch of judgment and condemnation and guilt, and I got news for you. Guess what's feeding that tree? bunch of guilt and condemnation and but you plant that tree in the love of God in Christ Jesus, and you know what's feeding that tree? The love of God. Hallelujah. My Lord, have mercy. This isn't hard to understand today, is it? Nope. He said, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, all uh, passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And Paul continues in Romans 8, nor, diet, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, there ain't nothing God ever made that has the power or the ability to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You know why? Because that's how big the love of God is. The Bible doesn't tell us that God loves. See, that's a verb. That means he does something. The Bible tells us that God is love. That's a noun. That means that those two items are synonymous. Love is God and God is love. Hallelujah. You can't separate one from the other because they are one and the same. God and love are one. Now listen to Romans 1. I'm going to try to tie it up right now. 
Just double checking your faces to see if there's anybody I need to slap after the service. <laughs> Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I got news for you today, church. Ungodly sinners and scornful folks are every bit as prevalent in the church as they are outside of the church. I know a lot, you know what ungodly means? It means that it's not godly. I know a lot of people in the church that will tell you and teach you everything about God that have nothing to do with God. I know people in the church, I know entire religious denominations that will teach you about God and not one word they're saying is true. You know what that makes what they're saying? Ungodly. If they're not telling you the truth, it's ungodly. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Anything that is not of God is, not, is ungodly. So if they're giving you a message that is not true to God and true to His Word, then that message is ungodly. And here the writer said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I got news for you. I lived a lot of my life in the church being counseled by ungodly people. Oh, my Lord. They counsel me. They teach me, Lisa. They taught me all kinds of things that the Bible don't say. They made me believe all kinds of things that the Word of God doesn't teach. Am I telling the truth? Nor standeth in the way of sinners blatantly break God's rules. I know people in the church. I had an overseer, not an overseer, I, I had a state uh, missions director, home missions director in the biggest apostolic Pentecostal denomination in the world. When I started my third church, this brother and I talked. The local pastor that I had been under for a couple of years said, uh, uh, did not want me to start an apostolic work, even though I was, do I was doing it almost 20 miles up the road. But he was an older man, and he was insecure, and he was afraid he was going to lose some of his people. I didn't want any of his people, trust me. I did not want any of his people. Not that they were all bad people, but he had a lot of them that met this description. You talk about ungodly, you talk about sinners, you talk about scornful, baby. He had a church load of them. The worst, honestly, it was the worst church I'd ever seen as far as having folk that were not where they ought to be with God. And it didn't have anything to do with the way they were dressing. They were all dressing right, but my God, their insides was rotten to the core. And anyway, he didn't want me starting a church so near. And boy, he opposed me left and right. He told me if I went up the road a little further, he'd support me. But he just didn't want me that close, see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I spoke to the home missions director of this Pentecostal denomination, this apostolic denomination, and he told me, he said, listen, the way it works in this denomination uh, when you go to start a church, other pastors in your area, you know, their input plays a large part in whether or not we can get behind you and, and accept you as, you know, a, a work on the part of our denomination. He said, however, if you start the church and you're successful and you get, you know, 20, 25 people coming to church and what have you, he said, as long as you, your teaching is consistent with the teaching of our denomination, he said, there is absolutely no way that that pastor can prevent us from then accepting you into the denomination. In other words, their rules were, we will accept any church, anywhere, at any time that teaches and preaches what we teach and preach, and there's no exceptions. But as far as them being able to get behind me from the start, they couldn't because of the input of this pastor. You follow what I'm saying? Well, I told my friend, Sister Vicki Johnson, 
What this man had told me, well, Sister Vicki Johnson, you know, she's one of them telephone, telegraph, tell Vicki. <laughs> she got on the bongos and started sending some smoke signals, and before too long, everybody in the country knew what this man had told me. And word got back to that pastor. And that pastor called this man in his denomination, this official in his denomination. Did you tell Brother Charles that? And this man, of course, being a good Holy Ghost filled Christian man, admitted, well, brother, I'm sorry, but yes, I did. Because to be honest, that is the way our denomination operates. No, Lisa, that's not what he said. You know what he said? No, I never said that. And all of a sudden, he's trying to make me look like the liar. And then the pastor comes to me. Well, so-and-so said he never said that, so you're lying. I called that man on the phone. I said, brother, i got news for you. I will never, so long as I live, ever, ever, ever come into your denomination because you lied and you had the gall. My Bible said all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. You had the gall to call my integrity into question. You had the gall to call my reputation into question. You had the nerve to make me look like a liar. All because you don't have the strength of character to stand behind your words. I said, well, I got news for you. I don't care if I build a mega church. We'll never, ever come into your organization. I promise you that. So I got news for you, folks. There are sinners in the church. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But the delight, his delight, is in the law of the Lord. And in the law of, excuse me, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This passage means a lot to me because I'm going to tell you something. I think about the Word of God literally. <laughs> my cousin used to be married to a fellow, and my fellow said one. This fellow said to my mother one time, said, "There's one thing about Chuck that really amazes me. Say he can be sitting there having a conversation with you, and the whole time his brain's off somewhere thinking about something else." <laughs> Television can be going, Martin. I can be on my computer, and I promise you, God is my eternal witness. I'm thinking and I'm meditating on the Word of God. I do it all the time. I love this passage because I understand the concept behind this. But on his law, he doth meditate day and night. I understand that concept because constantly scripture, constantly the word of God, constantly the principles of God are, are washing through my mind. Now listen, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Oh, my goodness. You get a tree planted by the waters of God's love. You get a tree planted by the way. You get a tree that's rooted and grounded in the love of God. And I'm going to tell you something. That tree is going to be successful. That tree is not going to wither and die. Hallelujah. That tree is going to live. There are more Christians today who are unsuccessful in being a witness and a testimony for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because they are not rooted and grounded in the love of God. They are full of judgment. They are full of criticism. They're full of hate. They're full of anger. They're full of malice. They're full of fear. Well, of course they are because that's what they're rooted in. That's what they're pulling up through their roots. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want to tell you today, folks, God has called us to be rooted and grounded.